Hello and welcome to the One Finance Masterclass. My name is Sonam Katri. I'm in ABP Marketing at One Finance. One Finance is on its journey to empower you to take control of your personal finances. And these masterclass are designed to see to it that you get insights from qualified financial advisors to empower yourself and most importantly, guide yourself to take informed financial decisions. And today's masterclass again is a superb start for the 2024 year because you're going to get the perfect strategies for investments for 2024 because we are focused on providing you with qualified financial advisory. Again, we have with us an experienced qualified financial advisor, Sneha Jain, who is a CEO and partner, Wealth Trust Capital Services. She has an experience in wealth management, financial planning and education outreach. Let's welcome Sneha Jain now. Thank you so much, ma'am, for doing this Thank for us. So um, this masterclass are usually done with experienced qualified financial advisors for the reason that we want everyone to take informed decisions. When we talk about informed decisions, we want them to gain insights about their personal finances. So thank you for doing this for us because uh, we cannot expect that uh, uh, you will not be given the insights. Instead, you'll be giving them a lot of invaluable opportunities where they have not even seen themselves. So investment strategies for 2024. Investment is one thing that has always been talked about that, oh, equities may invest karna hai. People are not seeing beyond equities that there are so many asset classes where actually they can invest. What's your view on this? Because you have been meeting a lot of clients. Absolutely, Sonam. First of all, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm really excited to do this workshop. Because as you said, you know, a lot of people, when it talks about, in, when we're talking about investing, they're all they're talking about is, you know, uh, equity mein kya ho Are aaj market itna gir gaya you know what's going on in the market ab kya karna you know now what agla next agla stock pick bataiye please agla stock pick bataiye you know Jee. now you know hdfc bank are itna kyun gir raha what's the problem yeah. there you know should i buy it so you know just things like that it's a lot of noise Absolutely. around market and there's so much happening in the market and a lot of people look at investing just as equity Absolutely. or then they are extremely traditional and they do asset classes which are extreme not even beating inflation Absolutely. so both ends of the curve are not good you know looking at it like a trading strategy or looking at it like a, a very very traditional approach Absolutely. won't work for your portfolio and i'm hoping to kind of change that mindset with this Absolutely. workshop here that completely works for us so let's get started let's start with a poll uh, we want to understand how much you understand investments and then investment strategy so first poll is uh, on the uh, uh, on your bar can you can check it what do you find most challenging about investing first is understanding market trends second balancing risk and reward third is finding time for research and fourth managing emotional decision making we are live right now on linkedin on our one finance website and twitter uh, for twitter you will have to comment the answers for linkedin and for our website you can easily put your answers over there in the poll section uh, please go and vote for yourself over there please put a uh, answer over there from your end okay let's just give two minutes to our audience and we will just check what is the answer that has come out and then you know you'll get a nice flow that what was the most challenging part about investing and maybe you know you can guide them accordingly okay let's have the answers please uh, team could you please flash the answers oh balancing risk and reward is 100 percent going towards uh, the answer that in investing, the most challenging part for them is balancing risk and reward. This is so true, right? I mean, absolutely. <laughs> and you know, this is, I, I think you'll get a lot of insight on this piece because balancing risk versus, you know, what is the reward going to be? Uh, it's a great insight to have when you're investing. So I'm sure. Absolutely. It, okay. Without you... further delay, Sia Chen, the floor is yours. All the best. Thank and you thank you so, so much. much. Thank, thank you, you Sonam. So let me, uh, you know, express the topics I'm going to cover in this presentation. Uh, the key investment opportunities beyond equity. So as we discussed, you know, it is a lot of about equity. Anything to do with investing is largely stock market kidder hai, aaj kidder khula hai, you know, kal kidder band hone wala hai, abhi kitne, in how much time will I get, what return, it's all about equity. So how do you kind of cut off that noise and think about, think about holistic financial planning? 
The second is key to a diversified portfolio. How do you think different asset classes? How do you make all this come in within your portfolio? How does it work out for you? And of course, how does this balance create a risk reward structure for you in the future? Then integrating investments in the holistic plan. So of course, all these investments, all these diversifications that we are talking about, how do you integrate all of them into your financial planning is, we, is what we will cover in the course of the workshop. And key factors for pre-investment analysis. Of course, before making any in any investment decision, for you to understand that asset class and how you can participate in that asset class is really important. And that is something that we will cover as well. And tailoring investments to suit your individual needs. Every individual's personal finance situation is different. Every individual's plan is different. So every individual needs to have a tailor-made plan to invest because of their own personal needs. And how can you make that decision based on your individual uh, setting and individual uh, needs is also something that we'll cover in my session. Next slide, please. So, you know, the India, we are obsessed with cricket, right? So I think this is a good way to kind of give you an analogy of saying, so let's look at this, where I have put Dhoni as the only person in the cricket team and imagine a cricket team with only Dhoni and then imagine a cricket team with all these. So of course, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a given that we would like to have a mixed, uh, you know, bag of players so that the team does well given everybody's qualities, right? So similarly, when it comes to investing, if we just had a dhoni in our portfolio, then if the market didn't do well or, you know, the market did very well and if you are just totally in a very traditional asset class, like probably an FT and the market is doing really well, you're going to miss that. And if, you know, market is not doing well for the next two years or an asset class that you have invested in doesn't do well for a few years, your portfolio is going to be a drag. So that's exactly what I mean by diversification and why it is so important. No better way to put it than this analogy here. So what are the various investment opportunities beyond you have to invest in? There are various different asset classes which you should be aware of and accordingly figure you know, what your perfect allocation will be depending on your holistic financial plan. So what are the various uh, asset classes beyond uh, equity? So it is real estate, you know, is one asset class. Of course, there's physical real estate that you can be part of. But there is also another way to be part of the real estate market for people who don't have that kind of fund to block in a real estate property. It could be through fractional ownership, which is REITs. There are listed, D, uh, listed REITs that you can buy onto your DMAT account. So that is a way to get participate in real estate through listed, uh, listed REITs. Then fixed income. Now fixed income is fairly large topic. It goes beyond FDs and FDs are not the only fixed income instruments. There are, you know, cash, uh, commercial papers, CDs, bonds, you know, so many things that you can take, take participation in other than the FD, which is the most traditional product. So you can be participating in bonds through CP, CDs, various, various fixed income instruments. Commodities. So commodities is anything which is metal, right? So your silver, you know, it could be gold. So how do you participate in gold, silver and not own the physical asset yourself? There are ways to pass, participate in silver, in gold, in commodities through again either ETFs or you know sovereign gold bonds which is a gold bond which gives you the market appreciation of gold but it lets you not own the physical gold so it gives you access to gold without owning gold itself. Um, then peer-to-peer -peer lending this is also a variation of fixed income instrument it's basically an instrument which gives you a fixed return 
but is based on P2P lending. So service linked loans are part of the P2P lending. Uh, bonds, again, as I said, is a subset of fixed income and that's why fixed income is also a very, very large topic and that's how you should have asset allocation within your fixed income portfolio as well. Then uh, there's Forex, there's options, derivatives, which is a trading strategy you can deploy. There are ETFs, so there are various ETF index funds which you can participate in. Again, they could be equity linked or fixed income linked. So the investment opportunities beyond equities and why are we talking about investment opportunities beyond equity? Because of the risk profile that each of this carries. So when you decide an asset class, right, the main important thing to evaluate is what is that risk of asset class of owning that asset class? So this is a way of kind of saying what is low risk within that asset class? Uh, what is medium risk and what is high risk and then making a portfolio which is balanced in terms of risk and this is what you know one of the bigger questions that all of you had in the poll was balancing between risk and reward this would give you that balance when you know which asset class falls under which risk category so over here if you were to see the lower risk is the government bonds, the debt, you know, the money market instruments, anything with fixed income. And even REITs could be a part of this because REITs has some kind of a rental yield that is expected cash flows that forms part of the overall, uh, uh, you know, um, the low risk category. So between low and medium risk could be REITs as well. Now, medium risk and high risk like comp be a medium and a high risk depending on the type of equity so a large cap equity will fall somewhere in a medium risk but a, a small cap equity would fall somewhere in a high risk so that's also something you need to evaluate when you're doing medium and high risk as well so you know within medium risk we would have equities we would have REITs again real estate um, you know um, high income bonds yeah uh, bonds which are credit risk so that, that doesn't fall under low risk and that would come part of the high risk portfolio. And of course, any trading strategies that, that you deploy, anything where you're taking margin to kind of invest in taking or, you know, uh, higher risk because trading can be momentum based and is, is a very momentum call that you're taking and thus could be much higher risk. And even a collectibles would probably be a higher risk. Okay, so let's break it down a bit. You know, we've spoken about the various asset classes. Now let's look at, you know, our next poll. Which of the following non-equity investment options interests you the most? I'm pretty excited to know the polls here. So go ahead. Wow. <laughs> I wasn't expecting this as the poll answer and that 100%. So real estate is something that really interests you. So we will deep dive a little bit onto this, you know, how you can be participating in real estate without really owning property and taking a one uh, residential or one commercial property risk and how you can probably diversify that risk also. Now, what are the benefits of these diversification? Why are we talking about, you know, mitigating these risks or why is it so important to diversify? Now, what happens? OK, so in the last one year, um, let's say the small cap index has delivered somewhere about 45 percent kind of a return. OK, and your large cap index has given about 18 year to date. I'm talking about the, cal uh, the calendar year. From Jan to December, the returns have been about 45% for a small cap index. For a large cap index, they've been about 18%. For gold, they have been about 12%. But for a international equity, they have been about 25 odd percent. If you look at the indexes, okay, S&P 500. And if you look at real estate, they're probably not actually the last year has been pretty uh, quiet for real estate. But this year, I mean, given the, you know, demographics, etc., there is expectation that the real estate sector would do really well for this year. Now, let's say because of your last year experience, 
you're very highly allocated into small caps by, because they give a very high return and you don't have real estate because it probably didn't give you any return or it remained flat. So how do you add real estate exposure to your uh, portfolio so that if this year real estate does well, you really enjoy those benefits also. That's why, you know, looking at um, portfolio diversification is so important, even in asset classes, because within equity also, there will be various asset classes that you have to diversify into. Okay, so what it would do, it would mitigate risk. So let's say last year, if you had only real estate and FD, okay, which is the two sectors which actually performed the least in the whole last one year. So if you had only FD and real estate, you would get about 8% and real estate, you know, would have been a very flattish growth as well. You would have really your overall portfolio wouldn't even have beaten inflation from a post-tax perspective. So what does a diversified portfolio do? It mitigates your risk. So what it's doing is, okay, you will own a little bit of FD, real estate, you know, uh, small cap, large cap, mid caps, everything inclusive will give you a good portfolio return. And even if one, two sectors within your diversification don't do well, it will at least not hamper your overall portfolio growth. Thus, mitigating risk is what a diversified portfolio does and maximizing returns. As I said, right, because these various asset classes have given different returns. So let's say you were very risk averse, you didn't put it only in a small cap uh, kind of a portfolio. I mean, it was the best performing for last year. So you would have not enjoyed any return from a very good asset class. Thus, what a diversified portfolio would have done Somewhere it would have done a flattish return, but you know, somewhere it would have made up the return through another asset class. And that's what we mean by maximizing returns. It would really do that uh, to you in an asset allocated portfolio. A skewed portfolio will be very good in a few years and very bad in the other years. And that's why diversification is so, so, so important. Uh, customizing liquidity. And it's a very, very uh, good point uh, to mention this because what does diversification do? Okay, so let's say if you were in a physical real estate and you had a goal where, you know, you wanted to get out of some uh, something uh, and you just can't get out because now it's real estate and it's not selling. Or even if it is uh, FD, uh, if you have only market link products, for example, uh, and the market has done very flat or actually has fallen, you will have no liquidity to kind of come out of the asset class if you're very skewed into one asset class. So, and even if you've done FD, which has a penalty clause, etc., which is a five-year FD, then again, it'll be tricky to come out because you'll have to pay penalty for it. So liquidity is also very, very important because when you have diversified, at least if one, two asset classes have done well, you could have probably got out of that and given yourself that liquidity if you had not planned holistically and you had not kept an emergency fund for that example. Uh, smoothing out vol volatility, it is, the, uh, it is about, you know, if some market cap versus some uh you know other product like commodity didn't do well probably last year or the year before that you know it would have smoothened out that volatility because gold as a product has also been extremely volatile so in that time if you had debt which is you know a non-volatile product at least those two products would have you know smoothened out your portfolio volatility so when we are saying smoothing out your volatility it's more from a portfolio volatility that we are talking about here so your risk adjusted returns, right? This balancing risk reward part is very important when you have various asset, uh, asset classes in between, uh, when you have various asset classes diversified in your investment portfolio. Um, so yeah, to move, before moving forward, we have a question here uh, from uh, Ms. Nisha. She's asking that, Will and won't my diversification or risk be focused on how much I actually have in my hand? Uh, isn't should be that all the investments should be done with whatever extra you have. So we should not be worried about the risk. That's what Nisha is trying to understand from this. So she must have kept some investment money aside hmm. and she it's not something that she's very much dependent on. And right. that's why she thinks not too risky. 
to uh, do this investments or do investments in any particular factors so very good point which i like to like discuss a little more on this is called inefficient investing because that extra surplus we are just thinking this is your investment money right personal finance is not about what is your investment money it is about holistic plan right why is the extra surplus lying into a non uh, you know non investment product when that is also surplus right all of that cannot be your emergency fund your emergency fund is ideally your 6 to 9 months of your monthly expenses not beyond that or even at the max one year but beyond that any money that is lying just in our savings account which is just your you are saying it is not your investment money then what exactly is it because it's actually losing money each day Absolutely. because of inflation and that is something you should be more concerned about because it's not about what your investment money is and that's why diversification of asset classes right you are scared and that's why you're keeping an x amount into investment mon- money thinking all these are very risky products that's the mindset that should not be the mindset because if you allocate well these are investment products which will give you growth right if you're keeping surplus which is doing nothing it's actually money that is losing value each day absolutely, absolutely. thank you sneha thank, thank you, you. <laughs> so uh, uh sorry i want to go back geographical diversification this is also a very very important aspect to your overall diversification as i said diversification is a process even within the asset class so even within an asset class right within uh, let's say equity so equity would have indian equity would have global equity would have us equity would have china equity for that uh, for that matter how do you make your portfolio diversify not only in the indian uh, indian uh, space of things so if you could take a little bit more global diversification so last year like the one year index right uh, your nifty did about 18% versus uh, the S&P 500 the US index was about 25% so where did you see more growth right and also our currency has depreciated so if you were put it through a fund route it would also further appreciate because of that so you know there are so many aspects to international and geographical diversification that should form at least some part percentage of your overall investments of course given your personalized holistic plan uh taking advantage of different life cycles because at 40 your needs will be very different at 50 your needs will be different and at 60 again they'll be very different so this is an example when we say right different life cycles should have different plans it's similar to your health and well being just imagine you know when you're a child right sugar kha lo junk kha lo sab pach jata hai right because you are running so much you're so like uh, you know always playing like my kids right i can i can tell them ha ha it's okay you can eat because you are like running all the time right but can i eat the same food that they eat uh, you know and consume that much food or uh, you know uh, given my age probably not right it's going to affect my health in different formats so similarly in investing depending on your age or depending on the goal you want to achieve how many years later your asset allocation has to be diversified accordingly because uh, at 40 or 50 what you did at 20 would probably not suit you and you are not in a growth phase you are probably in a family uh, stage where you have dependents where you have children their cost are going to come in so if you are going to go for excessive growth and look at you know strategies will which will give you the highest returns potentially but it may take time to give you that returns and you don't have that much time then it will not work out well so think of this life cycle like how you would think nutrition as well uh, it's a great way to kind of put an analogy i think uh, to think of health and investment in the same limelight of course given different life cycles in your life enhancing peace of mind so if you have a well diversified portfolio you will be so much at peace because you will not be scared like how uh, nisha pointed out right that uh, i have investment money that I have put in why is she feeling that because maybe she feels all this is risky first of all when these asset classes when you're really allocating it in a way which is right for your portfolio 
then the risk is really reduced and that's what you have to kind of do to your portfolio to feel confident to put all your money at work and not do inefficient investing so integrating these investments all that we spoke about how do you put it planning it depends at the stage you are the various goals you have in life right one could be of course retirement which is inevitable we have to retire one day we'll have to give up the job probably the business we don't want to depend on anybody for so many years you didn't ask money from anybody to sustain your lifestyle you don't want that lifestyle to dip how are you going to ensure what you spend today inflation adjusted you will be able to spend 20 years later think inflation adjusted when you think retirement planning otherwise your corpus will be so little that you will not be able to sustain a good retirement without depending on anybody then will and estate planning a lot of people don't even think about will don't think about estate planning until they really reach in their 60s life is unpredictable we travel a lot uh, you know we are living in a, a, a city where of course the aqi levels are higher i mean life is unpredictable you don't know what's going to happen next all the wealth that you have accumulated you at least want the dependents to get it mess free and you want them to at least have a peaceful life if at all something had to happen so make it very clean from a paperwork perspective will and estate planning is as equally important as any other aspect and one should definitely look at doing it a uh, cash flow planning so you know uh, cash flows are not a problem when your salary is coming in right you get a relief are first ko credit aa gaya right so that relief should be for a lifelong no so cash flow pl- planning is very important in that sense now that cash flow how you feel the credit is come right you feel relieved that relief you should have for all goals in your life so what is cash flow planning it is planning for goals like let's say children are going to go study abroad and that's a goal 20 years later how are you going to manage that cash flow and how much is enough from an inflation adjustment point of view to inflation for education is only increasing by 10 12% not even at 6 7% which is the cpi if you see education has become way more expensive than anything else which was you know out in at least in my years or in anyone uh, i know 15 years earlier education was much cheaper than it is today so how are you going to grapple and take on those cash flows 15 years later that's also a plan right so cash flow planning means planning for every goal so it could be cash flow for a particular goal or it could be like retirement every month you need a credit like a salary if the salary stops and that will not ha- happen only through your pf your pf is not going to be able to give you so much uh, money to have cash flow plans till 85 90 it's going to be very difficult for the pf alone or for one asset class alone to be able to make you uh, you know stride through that journey of cash flow planning insurance planning i think this is one of the most uh not uh thought of planning uh everybody first of all most of the people i know they'll take up uh, the corporate gives them health insurance they'll not take up their own health insurance at 50 54 when they are about to get on a you know sabbatical want to leave the job for a few years and then want to move into something else they have no health plan in uh, you know of their own if you don't have your own financial uh, insurance security uh, it's going to be a very big amount that you will have to you know keep aside just for medical emergencies which is not a very healthy thing to do so insurance has to be planned again thinking of medical cost over the years it cannot be like you know your sum insured can be 5 lakh given the current uh you know uh, current expenses it has to be topped up depending on what could be the expenses in the later years also because once you get any detection of any of the uh, you know um, ailments etc topping up your insurance policies will be much more difficult 
and insurance planning also has a very important aspect of critical illness riders and term insurances we are one of the most uh, under insured countries in the whole world most people have money back policies which are clubbed into you know investment thinking insurance policies uh, where your your some insured for your nominee so what is insurance right you are you are taking a car insurance for example you are taking it if your car ko kuch ho jaye na not like you want the money back agar kuch nahi hua car ko that is not how you can think about insurance so similarly if something happens to the breadwinner of the family a term insurance is so essential for the nominees because they are really dependent on your income so there has to be a very holistic plan made for insurances of course depending on your liabilities on what your nominees etc would need as expense if something had to happen to the owner in the house so insurance planning is essential very very essential tax planning again you know we wait until march are you abhi tax planning nahi kiya now you invest and then you are investing in a rush you don't want to read through the instruments that you are investing in and you're just going and putting away money and locking in money because most tax exemptions are locked in money uh, you know if you do a pf 15 years if you're doing insurances and probably for a much longer period etc so please do your tax planning well in advance also tax planning also in, uh, you know involves a very essential part which is uh, calculating your post tax return so a lot of people write when you do traditional asset classes and if you're doing fts and if you're in the higher tax bracket actually that what will that do is give you tax incidents every year versus if you even put it in a fixed income product it will at least give you tax incidents only at the time of redemption like a debt mutual fund so one needs to think of tax incidents at a uh, investment level also because it's not only the exemptions that are tax planning tax planning is also what is your post tax return of your overall portfolio which is very essential to understand because that's the actual return that you have made right liability planning of course if you have loans which are way beyond your means it's not a very healthy situation you have to analyze your situation you know make sense of your liability versus your income and you know everything has to be calculated depending on your income and it cannot be your income is x and you know you have 70% of emis it will not add up in the longer term uh of course and then investment planning which is diversification through various uh, investment avenues okay another quick poll what do you consider the most important aspect of holistic financial planning go on put your votes okay this is uh wealth building is one of the important aspect which is great Ado- adapting to economic changes and aligning finances with personal goals lovely so we have a good uh, balance between uh, you know aligning yourself to your own personal goals and i do think that's a very 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 important aspect to financial planning and one of the most uh, uh, you know aspects that one should definitely consider now what are the benefits of holistic financial planning um so when when if you're not thinking about if you're just thinking wealth building right for example you will never think about you know then it will be like a case where you know one of the questions was about just having this much put in investments and then we just see over the years what it gives us uh but if that is the nature of your investment uh you know approach you are never going to consider inflation as a matrix now if you don't consider inflation as a matrix you'll never be able to replace the cash flows that you are expecting from these investments that you make to be inflation adjusted and that's why when you sit on a plan from a holistic perspective and look at you know uh look at uh, you know um, uh, the whole aspect personal finance aspect as for your goals 
you will put in inflation as a very key number in that and which is very important so lessens the effects of rising inflation when you do holistic planning of course it's for wealth building for uh, you know people who have taken care of their personal goals and then they want to create wealth uh, for the future and probably from a legacy perspective also so of course it adds up uh, for wealth building from that perspective but before that first take care of your own personal goals and then the second step could be going into wealth building um uh, adaptability to economic changes of course uh, depending on uh, you know your plan if you are sitting today right if you are in 2024 with this plan what happens today in this today's market if you are not thinking and if you have not uh, you know ad- adapted to the economic conditions now in india today you know uh, a few uh, a few portfolio a few asset classes are looking very attractive from today's times so you know giving allocation to probably because debt has been pretty flat for the last 2 3 years uh, debt as an asset class could do really well with the yield softening right if we expect the yields to go down in the next one year or so this could have a good capital gain within your debt funds particularly so actively managed debt funds could be a very interesting way to get into fixed income given the current market scenario then today within the current you know current market right if you are more uh, if you are building a portfolio today your you could be more skewed to large cap or you know quality companies than going for something which has given a staggering 30 40% kind of a return and the problem is most people do have a herd mentality so they will go to asset classes which have done very well in the last 2 3 years but that's not how you look at market you look at market from a forward perspective so the forward looking market looks at today given the current portfolio composition will be great to have some read exposure would be great to have some fixed income exposure the longer duration bond perspective and would be great to again have large cap and quality company equity exposure so that as per today's time you are well aligned for the next one two years and be prepared for today and tomorrow so as you know this is also very uh, interesting aspect of holistic planning uh, if you look at your tomorrow you will be better placed today to make financial decisions bases your goals tomorrow and it all also of course will reduce your financial stress you know you are you aaj kaun sa stock pick karna hai all those things will be kind of uh, you know reduced and it will help your financial journey much better um, yes sneha because you raised this part i have got a question from mr rohit he is asking that investing in markets and mutual fund makes me very scared very nervous can we avoid this asset class fully so i think the stress increases sometimes when you are in some certain asset classes uh, which are highly volatile mm-hmm. and i think uh, can we skip this completely one complete asset class uh, so mutual funds first of all is a very large uh, asset class itself okay mutual fund is not the asset class mutual funds are a uh, a bouquet of investments of depending on the scheme so it could be a debt mutual fund also it could be a hybrid also it could be equity also if equity scares you at least go for something which will have all asset classes so it cushions your portfolio not being part of the india growth story not being part of the indian stock market or the mutual fund within the equity space for the next 10 years you are really going to lose out i'm sorry to say but it has to but yes as we said you can cushion it by you know giving a good uh, other other asset classes by putting them in you can cushion your portfolio from that as long as you stick to quality as long as you stick to things which are very plain vanilla it should not scare you the problem is you're looking at it too soon and that's why probably it's scaring you you have to give businesses time it's like how can something like investing in a infosys scare you are they going to shut shop tomorrow it they are not going to right it's a fairly large company just an example so it's not like the stock market will just go bust tomorrow that way to then be and you me everybody <laughs> will kind of be out of jobs <laughs> so i don't know why it scares you you know you're looking at it very differently <laughs> yeah, thank you
Okay, go ahead. So traditionally, that it's embedded. Ha, chalo, ye to bahut safe hai, right? But as I said, as long as you understand what you are doing, you will not call it unsafe. You're in a FD. You're lending your money to a bank to lend to someone else. You know, in the real sense of it. In equity, you're becoming a shareholder of a company where you're confident of its growth. So if you're not confident of companies you've never heard. invest in a bouquet of companies which are you know things you have seen heard everything right let's give me an let's give you an example of a few companies that i can you know just say out of uh, uh, very uh, easy access and you can see them around like icici or hdfc right you see the banks the branches etc is that company going to shut shop like you know uh, the very next day so these are not at least you can invest in a bouquet of stocks where you feel very confident that these companies are something that you see every time touch feel right it is not something that you are not aware of as long as you put your money in things that you are aware of you are scared uh, you know the kind of uh, things that you think about the market won't be there because your experience will be like ha chalo a quarter it didn't do well or the one year it didn't do well it will yet do well in a longer term because you can see feel you know you can you hear news about them enough for you to feel confident about those companies so that's a very good way to start off for someone who has uh, you know mindset that stock market is a very bad place to be in so you when you do pre investment analysis right you just approach it from this perspective that you know what are the market sentiments what is the management expertise like i said right uh, companies where you can understand these things you know where you can listen to the founder speak there's enough and more information available out there about various asset classes that you want to invest in even bonds right uh, bonds that you probably want to uh, you know take you could probably do some research on the companies bonds that you are talking about uh, so it is very important to look at you know what the management is talking about the company that you are investing in uh, what are the industry analysis what is the uh, financial performance been over the years so something where you look at little bit back tested data where you understand that over the years this company or this stock or this fd you know have given you consistent uh, returns uh and then of course risk an analysis depending on your portfolio and your period of investing you're 27 you don't have any goal that needs to be fulfilled right away all your goals are in the longer term are in the future then your asset allocation or your diversification has to be high risk because you are you are risk tolerant because you have time risk risk of the asset class right depends on the time period so stocks may be a uh, risky in the shorter period of time but in a longer period of time we will see that you know usually in a five year period uh, you know these things usually outperform the traditional asset classes so for a person who mr prakar uh, you know if he is 27 years old has has a high risk tolerance and wants to accumulate wealth he could have predominant inv investments in uh, themes themes which are the future of india like we all know right so much infrastructure development is happening in india we know that infrastructure as a theme would do really well so you could be part of a theme which is the indian theme for the next 10 years but this could be high risk right so particularly in uh, uh, you know sectors like or uh, tech or you know even renewable energy everybody is talking about green energy shifting to ev uh, all of that so companies which are part of that uh, healthcare uh, we are really lacking behind in healthcare and this is something we are going to see in the next 10 years as evolve a lot so this person can take all these risks because these are all 8 10 year kind of things and that kind of you know holding capacity has to be there high risk but could be higher return definitely active management so of course equity mutual funds which are uh, you know more actively managed which are more higher risk can also be part of this growth oriented portfolio and a little bit of alternative investments like if you know looking at uh, some type of uh, 
IPOs, etc. Though I'm not a big fan of IPOs because you know it shouldn't be like you're just doing it for the uh, listing gain. If you really believe a company's potential is there, you can look at IPO investing. And uh, of course, when a company is just newly listed, it will take some time to perform, maybe five seven years to really prove and make your money in it. That's what happened to people who invested in Infosys in '91 during IPO times, you know, in 20 years, they made a lot of wealth. So you have to look at it like that. And for a person like 27, if he really invests for 20 years by 47, there'll be a lot of wealth to be made within the growth asset classes. But let's say, you know, um, but of course, this portfolio will be highly volatile. So that is something, you know, the person has to uh, understand between risk and reward because the holding capacity is great you can actually have a longer term portfolio but will be volatile portfolio go next amul so he is 40 years old he has a lot of life responsibilities that he needs to cover so for a person like that going into something which is high growth may be very difficult at this time he must be looking at conservation or meeting life goals in the next three five years and of course you know uh, also planning for his retirement so in such a case what is a good balanced approach for a 42 year old or a 40 year old who has life goals which are more, more short term in nature could be of course you know fixed income instruments P2P and bonds and, uh, you know, uh, FDs, a mixture of all of that could be a higher, uh, you know, investment category, gold, uh, REITs probably. So all, the, all that could be a good uh, balanced approach, but with equity, but with equity could also be a little more large cap oriented and not on the very small and mid cap where horizon is more than 7, 10 years. So for someone like that, you know, the investment should be in conservation conservation kind of and not growth oriented kind of a portfolio a conservation and a balanced kind of a portfolio and that can come through a little more risk free asset classes okay lovely so we'll move to q a uh, now Absolutely, Sena. Thank you so much for this insightful session, Mr. Amol. He's asking, can I aggressively invest for retirement? I'm comfortable living with less right now. So maybe a more retirement focus or something that he's looking for. Uh, so Amol, uh, the thing is, you know, uh, comfortably invest for retirement and live for less is one thing. But let's say if you've not built your emergency fund, okay, and you're just like, Many India's growth story is intact. Let me just go ahead and invest. And what if a war happens somewhere? Mm. We are very much on the uh, verge of that. You know, it looks like somewhere. So these things cannot be looked at like this, right? It should not be what I'm going to not spend today. And that's why I'm investing it for the long term. But I'll invest very aggressively. Aggressive is a, a state of mind or a risk, you know, as per your customization. And you should look at it like that, right? If you build a good emergency fund, you know, come what may, I will manage with less and all is one thing. But I have something to tap in if for the three, five years also my aggressive portfolio is extremely volatile. So if you're able to do that, then yes, you can be a little more aggressive. Okay, we have a next question from Khushi ma'am. How should I know what is my risk appetite? This is an interesting question, absolutely. So your risk appetite is based on your goal on the time horizon of investing. So let's say, and see risk appetite is one is having a risk appetite where you just feel scared. Yeah. Are this is very scary. I don't understand it, right? But one is sitting down for your own customized solution, right? Uh, this is not something where it's like your low risk profile so you should not invest in equity at all or you're high so you should only invest in equity it doesn't work like that you could have a risk profile but eventually where you invest right depends on the time horizon a lot with your risk profile combined absolutely it will be a little more personalized yes, so you'll have to actually take guidance from a proper qualified financial advisor also sharing your personal situation also yes. whether what will be your risk profile okay uh, mr anish is asking if i'm looking for a long-term investing which assets are right for me 
so long term investment of course if, if you're aggressive you know looking at growth investments of course equity uh, you know and reits could be a very interesting or uh, proposition but gold should definitely in given today's dynamics commodity should definitely form part of your portfolio from a hedge perspective because if something has to happen from a macroeconomic perspective gold would give you a good hedge within your overall portfolio and even bonds at this very moment if we feel the yields are going to soften there is a good chance to make risk free returns which could be very attractive okay uh Ms. Aditi is asking, every time I invest into anything, should I be checking the taxation of that particular investment first? Yes, post-tax post tax returns make a huge difference in your overall portfolio return. You should be aware of the taxation of investment, at least from a post-tax perspective. But see, 15 years later, taxes are an incidence of today. I mean, there was a time there was equity mutual funds didn't have any tax. Yeah. But now they have tax. So it's not like your investments when you're redeeming after 15 years won't have tax. Do know the tax, but the tax cannot be the only decision making uh, ability, you know, a decision making point in investment. Absolutely. Okay, we have this question. There's no name to it. But yes, what is the right age for making a will? A, a will should be made as soon as um, maybe you get into personal finance goals when your goals start happening. I mean, initially when you're just investing, it's too little, right? I mean, if you're just doing, let's say, mutual funds, then what will you will? Because you're already putting a nominee there. So ideally, you know, the nominee will get the money. But if you have uh, assets, etc., right, which are to be distributed etc then the whole will planning and all of it comes in picture so ideally in your 30s 35s is sure. when you should look at will plan okay uh, i hope i'm pronouncing this name right gunjesh is asking how much shall i cover for medical insurance is it better to have family combined one or an individual one no, of course, you should have a family floater because if you have kids, you will not take a kid separate policy. It's not needed. Definitely a family floater, but depends on the city you are living in. So if you're living in a tier one, you should have higher coverage versus if you're living in tier two, tier three, where, you know, health expenses, hospital expenses are lower, you should call, you can probably have a lower coverage. So it's not a one uh, fit for all. As I said, pers you know, personal finance is personal and that's how it should be. It has to be customized depending on your expenses because it depends on which hospital also you will go to. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Looking at the healthcare cost, yes, please consider that yeah. part. Yes. Okay, Mr. Tushar is asking, how many times should I realign or review my investment strategy? Looking at so many global events continuously impacting my portfolio. Uh, so if your wealth manager or your advisor tells you to stay put, you should listen to them. <laughs> okay. okay, now Mr. This Karan. Excessive information is not always good. Uh, not like it, no information is also Absolutely. good. So as long as there's a balance, it's it should be, you stay invested. Okay, Mr. Neeraj Sharma is asking, shares, property or gold, which is the good thing for investment? So this is again personalized, but yes. No, as I said, you know, real estate, uh, gold are more, uh, gold is more of a hedge to your overall portfolio. It cannot be like 70% of your portfolio, right? That's a lot to give to a gold asset class. Uh, real estate, again, you know, I feel we are very skewed to real estate. Most of the portfolios will have a large portion of will liquid real estate. Uh, and not have anything which is liquid. So if you're owning physical real estate, which is very high value, one, two crores, and if you're having only a liquid portfolio of 20, 30 lakhs, it doesn't add up. So it has to be asset allocated from that perspective. Okay, uh, Mr. Karan has specific questions. First, also explain the risk of debt bonds. First, and the second one is, is swing trading with uh, risk exposure of 2 to 3% of the entire capital a good idea for young investors in their 20s? Uh, see, in their 20s, people want to explore. So I'm not against the trading aspect at all. Like, But trading is not investing. You're exploring, you're understanding. And if you're you know, deploying some strategy there, it's completely up to you. But your overall, if 100% is your portfolio value, you should not go beyond 3-5% in trading, I would say. If that too for a young guy, okay. So if it's 1 lakh, you know, you're trading with 10,000. It's like that. Yeah. Uh, but trading is not investing. 
it's just for your probably adrenal rush that you're doing it <laughs> and for debt bonds um, bonds are safe depending on what bond you're investing in whether they have a credit risk what uh, how rated are they uh, whether you're investing in a gseg or a you know corporate bond what is the corporate bonds uh, rating so there are various aspects to bond investing of course they are much safer compared to equity but if you're taking credit risk probably it is not safer so you know you have to give it merit depending on what bond are you investing in because if you're just going to invest in a high paying bond yeah. which gives you 12% yield and think there's no credit risk that that won't be the case okay we have one more specific question from uh, mr rahul if i have medical and term insurance through my company should i also buy it separately absolutely that was one of my points you are going to retire some day you will leave the company some day you cannot depend on the company to pay for your health uh, in the later years and later years the health insurance will be very expensive and if you have a very stressful life if you have any ailments you know any uh, detections it will be far more difficult to get a health insurance all right all right let's take this last question priyanka ma'am is asking if i'm a beginner how to start how much should i put from my income for investments i don't have any dependents so i think i can take risk uh so at at least when you are starting off i mean minimum you know book rules uh, you know to if you are making 100 rupees go for at least 20 rupees which is investing uh, i think if you have no dependents you can go as much as 50% uh, as part of your income as investing but of course depends where you are staying how much you know you are spending on rent and other things so at least 20 and go up to 50 Absolutely. All right. So there were a lot of specific questions being asked. Please note all your personal situations, all your financial situations are different from each other. So always go to a qualified financial advisor to get your financial planning done properly. Because obviously it's personal, right? It has to be a personal right advice. These master classes are designed to see to it that you take informed decisions so that you do not get missold by any financial advisor. So thank you so much, Neha, ma'am, uh, for doing this. with us for this master class we every month come with one master class for you we'll be back again in february you can always back, watch back this master class on linkedin twitter and on our website and our website has all your master classes in one place so do not forget to go and subscribe for the one finance on social media and do definitely check out the website of one finance thank you again ma'am for doing this thank for you sonam it was a pleasure it thank was you. a pleasure being here thank, thank you, you. bye bye